So we are now into March, speeding towards spring break next week. And we are moving now, it's a momentous time, from pixel-based images into vector-based images. And so we introduced this project before, uh, especially proving ground number two, which you have sketched for and we're going to be posting today. But I want to go through the whole module here because this is a different way of using digital art. And it's something that's incredibly unique to digital art. There isn't really a good substitute for vectors in the traditional world. And before we had computers, imagery that had to be clean like vectors, especially things like type design and logo design, you would actually paint it by hand oversized on something called uh, illustration board with what are called graphic inks. So Pelican makes them, there's black, graphic black and graphic white. And you would just paint the thing as cleanly as possible. These are super opaque paints that you can keep refining the edge. And then that would be photographed at high resolution. And then that photograph would be turned into, oh, what do they call it? Like a laser cut film work <laughs> that's basically a perfect stencil of the thing. So the analog traditional uh, equivalent of a vector really is something cut out with a blade from something physical so that the edge is there. It's not pixel based anymore. Whereas the equivalent of pixels, like we've talked about, is a little square mosaic, right? And the more tiles you have, the more little squares, the higher resolution it is. So this question of the day really helps you to articulate what the difference is between them. So what are the advantages of vector-based imagery over raster-based imagery? And what are the disadvantages? When would using a vector-based image be more effective than a pixel-based image? So let's look at this image. This is not my own work, right? This is just an example from a, a printing website. So if you want this illustration of a bear with its mouth open, you know, maybe it's a sports mascot or something. If you do it as a vector, no matter what scale you print that bear, whether it's on the side of a building, whether it's on a t-shirt, whether it's on the corner of a business card, every curve of each of these filled in black shapes will be perfectly clean, like it's cut out of something, right? And I think of, you can buy a sticker vinyl. And when you have gallery shows, they will cut your name out of sticker vinyl and put it up on the wall, right? And the name of the show. And you can choose any kind of shapes you want. You know, most people use Times New Roman or Helvetica or something, but you can choose any shape because typefaces are vectors, right? And as long as you have vectors, they can cut it out of the vinyl. And there are machines you can buy at home that do this for you. I think they're called crickets, right? And you're physically cutting out of this material just like you would with an exacto knife through construction paper. That's what vectors are able to do. So it's going to be perfectly clean no matter what size you do it. If it's pixel based, then as that size changes, those pixels show up more or less. And that's the resolution, right? So vectors have no resolution. Just like when you choose Times New Roman 12 point for a term paper, you can change it all of a sudden to 72 point and it's not like the letter T of your first sentence becomes all fuzzy. It's always perfectly clean, no matter the size. That's because typefaces are vectors. And then there are these slides we went over last class, but the beginning of these slides is all about the difference between vectors and raster. And I will take the time to play this little, uh, digital honors video, which was all done actually in Flash. This was early when I started teaching this class. It's rare that I have a student that prefers vector imaging to raster imaging. And this was back in 2011. And back in 2011, which doesn't seem that long ago to someone as old as me, but in digital art technologies, that's a long time. Uh, in that time, bitmap was still being used as kind of a equivalent word to raster. 
bitmap means that you are taking bits and you are mapping them, right? The problem is what a bit is instead of a byte is a bit is just a one or a zero. And so ones and zeros are the, the two modes computers can understand. It's the switch that's turned on and off that makes all data. So bitmap now means that the image is either a black pixel or a white pixel. There's, it can only be those two things. Bitmaps are always pixel based, but they're, they're reduced to only black and white pixels. Ones or zeros, like the most basic digital image data for raster. Annoying, I don't know why it's not working. Let's see, let's do it this way. So he, in this video, uh, this student calls raster pixel-based images bitmaps, because that used to be the terminology for them. But the bitmaps he's thinking of are just like any raster image we've created in the class. It can support millions of colors. They're just based on pixels. This isn't good. Let me figure this out. Because this is linked on my YouTube page. And this is why when you do your group presentations and you embed a video, you want to make sure it works. Oh, it's because my stupid things. It's because I have my tablet plugged in with the... Uh, I'm splitting too many functions into my laptop. Remember how it wouldn't play YouTube videos because of that. All right. Anyway, I highly recommend that video. <laughs> I'll make sure it works when I'm not trying to present on the projector. But it will talk you through them. So this is the rundown of it. Vectors are perfectly sharp and clean at any resolution, at any size, because they are not based on resolution. They are cut from point to point, just like cutting with an exacto knife. They're ideal for single or simple color shapes with hard edges. Though once you define the vector shape, you can fill it with kind of anything you want. You can fill it with a pattern, with a gradient. And that, that fill can make it appear that the edges are soft. But in actuality, that vector will always have an incredibly sharp edge. You just get to decide whether you see it or not on whatever background it's on. When you work with vectors, you want to treat each shape as separate cutouts that are layered on top of each other. So think, if you were to have a piece of black construction paper and you were asked to cut out an image with an X-Acto knife of a bear, you want to do it kind of shape by shape, and then you can kind of layer them in. Vectors are clean. Raster pixel base can look clean on a screen because... A screen is always pixel based. The lights in the screen are lighting up pixels. But as those grow at different resolutions, they can lose quality. You can see it clearly in the ear, in the eye. And so vectors are, are always the way to go for kind of flat graphics. This is a good, good thing to remember, kind of old 8-bit Mario or old video game technology for the arcades. This is all pixel based, right? but on a very small pixel grid. When you do a vector version of it, you can get every kind of curve and nuance. And again, you can fill those vector shapes with gradients. You can fill them with uh, lower opacity, higher opacity colors, and really create anything you want. And vectors have two components to them. Once you make the path, which is the shape, you can have a fill which you see here with the red and the skin and all of that. But then you can also have a stroke, which is the outline around the vector. And so here we see an outline stroke and then e internal strokes. And then each of those can also be filled with a color or a gradient. Now, in general, this is how vectors are colored. You start with flat local color, filling in the base. 
So we're going to take your black shape logos and we're going to experiment with just changing that black into a different flat base color. But then you can add things like shading. And you usually do that by doing a hard edge duotone, like finding a highlight on top of that flat color. And then you can play with soft edge, you know, gradating the edge of those, those highlights. And we'll get in, into this more when we are doing our colored illustrations. So all of these, whether they're sports mascots, for musical acts, for food companies, for corporate brands, all of them are vectors. And notice how the more prominent they are, the more heavily used they are, the simpler they tend to be. That the Rolling Stones, Starbucks, Twitter, I mean, Twitter and Starbucks are the biggest of these slides, right? They are one color. Batman's pretty big, two colors, right? And they've simplified the Batman logo uh, over time. So that's why this one changes a lot with relaunches, right? But you don't even need the yellow. And so you'll often just see it with just the, the internal bat. Now, ones that are a little bit more niche or have a, a lifespan, like Obama's campaign logo from 2008, that's going to have more nuance to it. But if that became kind of the Obama library logo, it's going to be more simplified again. Why? Because a good logo has to be versatile. And to be versatile, not only does it need to be infinitely scalable, it needs to be easily reproducible. You need to be able to stitch it on a jacket, you know, and you can't do gradients if you're doing stitching on a jacket. At least you can't do it cheaply. But if you have single color, clean shapes, you can put that image anywhere. So that versatility is really key. And that's a different way for thinking about artists. Uh, very often, and I'm like this, I'm an illustrator, I like images that have a lot going on. The kind of additive, you add to your idea, you add detail, you add color, you add nuance, you add kind of flames coming out the back. Logos, that is a bad idea because it takes away from the clarity of it. And as you're looking at your sketches and you're deciding on which one's the best for your colleague's sketches and for your own sketches and how can it be simplified, it's always good to think, not just in these three approaches, but also is there anything I can do to simplify it, to make it more clear? So this is what we're doing. We're taking our, our theme for the semester, which is doing your own version of our campus mascot, Nico the Nighthawk. You can even create your own campus mascot. You are not going to be scored on how close you are to the theme, right? It just gives you a way to start. And we can go through the unit module or we can go right to assignment four because this proving ground number two is part of assignment four. And we're going to do three sketches and post them that show those different approaches. So symmetrical, central, uh, dynamic. So central symmetrical is like the Target logo. Dynamic is like the Nike logo. And a play of positive and negative space are these ones where your black shapes actually create a new space and recognizable icon within the, the white space, the negative space. Alex, question. So for your sketches, for your clear, engaging, and versatile logo solution in black shapes, you need to make one that is central symmetrical, one that is dynamic, and one that plays with positive and negative space. And this has everything to do with how it moves your viewer's eye, their eye movement through the piece. So central symmetrical, just like the Target logo, you go in and then you leave. It like centers it right towards the middle of the design. Doesn't mean it needs to be perfectly symmetric. Dynamic means it moves the eye through the piece, usually with diagonals and curves, like the Nike swoosh, instead of jumping to the middle and then jumping out. Right? And then a play of positive and negative space actually holds the eye the longest, but it can hurt your clarity. So what it does is it makes you recognize the black shapes first, and then noticing that there's something weird about it, it engages you to 